In summary, Segaid in episode 45 is a real land of contrasts, a mixed bag. We're at summer 1987 now, and to this point, Sega Master System has really impressed with the quality of software that Sega has released for it, and just how well it fares against the NES lineup. But as we all know, Nintendo ultimately sold 10 times as many consoles in the 8-bit era as Sega, at least in the US. So what accounts for that difference? I think here, as we enter the back half of 1987, we begin to see the cracks show in Sega's approach, versus that of Nintendo's. Several key things happened in 1987 to shift the balance of the console race forever in Nintendo's favor. Or at least until Genesis came along. First, Nintendo's third-party release roster greatly expanded. Sega had taken a traditional approach to managing the SG-1000, bringing all games by all developers in-house to release on the system as first-party products under the Sega label. In 1983, that's more or less how consoles worked all around the world, the exception being Atari's 2600, where third parties had locked down legal rights through the courts and promptly flooded the market with an uncontrolled surge of garbage. Nintendo initially also took this same first-party-only approach, but by several accounts, Hudson and Namco forced their hand by publishing their own games for the family computer in 1984. Rather than fight this development the way Atari had, Nintendo instead embraced it, creating a partnership system with other publishers, allowing them to release their own games as official third-party titles so long as they cut Nintendo in on the profits. While not perfect, witness the glut of poorly made material that we saw toward the end of NES Works Guide in 1985, this system gave Nintendo the best of all possible worlds. It meant external studios had incentive to produce games for Famicom and make tons of money, while Nintendo profited directly from their licensing fees, and indirectly profited from the fact that the breadth of available games made Famicom a more appealing platform for consumers. Nintendo sharpened up its licensing approach when it launched the NES, becoming more controlling and arguably tilting things to the licensee's disadvantage. Still, the NES library began to expand beyond first-party Nintendo creations toward the end of 1986, and by the following summer, third-party titles outnumbered Nintendo's own products on NES. Those games also didn't always hit the mark, but the best of them raised the bar for game design. Meanwhile, as Nintendo's own releases slowed to a trickle, the company's internal studios invested more thought and ambition into them, as well as better technology. Nintendo and its licensees began to experiment with chips that could make use of greater memory while also enabling features that didn't exist in the hardware itself. The Legend of Zelda and Metroid couldn't have existed on NES without the MMC-1, which brought many features of the Japan-only disk system expansion to the base American console. Mike Tyson's Punch-Out ran on the unique MMC-2, which used Space Harrier's background tiles as interactive characters trick to incredible effect, and the console would only grow in add-on capabilities from there. Meanwhile, Sega continued to truck along and publish everything under the first-party banner, even on Master System. Although we've already seen the arrival of external developers in the Master System ecosystem, it would be years before the console saw proper external publishing efforts. And by that point, the product was more or less moribund in the US and Japan. And in terms of expansion capabilities, the Master System simply hadn't been designed for on-card enhancements the way the Famicom and NES had been. Rocky set a new high watermark for the Master System tech by doubling the size of the onboard memory for the cartridge, shipping as a 2 megacart, that is 2 million bits of data or 256k, and battery-backed saves would eventually enter the picture as well. Otherwise though, the Master System wouldn't see the sort of on-cart enhancements that became central to the NES platform, and with fewer third parties to help push the console's limitations, the American Master System never fully realized its potential. Of course, that wasn't entirely Sega's fault. By the time the console began to pick up speed, Nintendo had leveraged its head start with the NES to lock third-party partners into exclusive relationships. And the rapid success of the NES made for an appealing system for other publishers. I recently spoke with a former Acclaim employee who claimed that the company had made something like $10 million on its first few NES releases. This amounted to President Greg Fishbach going to Japan, finding five interesting games to license for the US, and releasing them with almost no additional work required. That's a formula that Sega, with its smaller stable of Japan-only titles, had difficulty competing with. As for why the NES took off so quickly, well, that ties in with Sega's other big setback for 1987. Nintendo had years of experience distributing toys and games in the US by the time the NES launched, 
thanks to its long history of creating interesting gadgets like Ultra Hand and Game & Watch. However, they also understood the importance of proper distribution, and rather than trying to set up a retail network on their own, they partnered with an existing American toy giant. Worlds of Wonder, creators of the talking Teddy Ruxpin doll. Worlds of Wonder was the secret sauce for Nintendo in 1986, the force responsible for leveraging the console's limited 1985 test run into a nationwide retail presence. Meanwhile, Sega's strength had always been arcade and vending distribution, and the company's executives took a little longer to come up with a similar strategy. By 1987, Worlds of Wonder had done such a great job of getting the NES into stores that Nintendo took over its own distribution going forward. And around the same time, Sega pivoted to imitate Nintendo's tactics by connecting with another North American toy powerhouse, Tonka, the folks responsible for those near-indestructible metal dump truck toys. Although online accounts give different dates for the beginning of this relationship, the best that I can determine is that contracts were signed in 1987 and Tonka's distribution began in early 1988. According to Moby Games, the first Master System release to show up in the US under the Tonka brand was March 1988's Afterburner. It appears that Sega and Tonka worked together until sometime in 1990, so many of the best-loved Master System releases came to the US under Tonka's supervision. The Tonka partnership also resulted in some of the more interesting quirks of the Master System library as well, such as a handful of carts, mostly reissues of early hits, that appeared with blue rather than red labels. By the time the two corporations parted ways, the disparity in the NES and Master System install bases was simply too great for Sega to overcome, and it reached a sort of self-sustaining critical mass. More people owned an NES, so more games appeared on NES, which enticed even more people to flock to Nintendo over Sega. Tonka could sell big yellow toy trucks, but they couldn't figure out how to overcome Nintendo's advantages. More games, more publishing partners, better tech enhancements. Sega and their developers put together some incredible software for Master System, but they couldn't keep pace with Nintendo's extensive collection of partners. And ultimately, the console's impressive performance and early lineup counted for very little in the US. But not for nothing. Sega learned a lot of hard lessons from the Master System and regrouped when it came time to begin the next generation race, using Nintendo's own strengths and tactics to launch the Genesis to success, allowing them to cut Tonka free and move ahead on their own. But that's a story for Segaiden 1989. Here in 1987, things are looking a little less rosy as Sega and Tonka begin their courtship in the background. Another superscalar arcade hit makes its way to Sega Master System, although you never know it based on appearances. If not for the title Enduro Racer on the box and the title screen, you'd never mistake this for the game that you played in arcades. To this point, Master System and its developers have really gone above and beyond in their attempts to translate the superscalar format, the cutting edge of arcade tech at the time, to the console, despite the Master System having more in common with the previous generation System 1 board. Sure, those conversions may not have been perfect, as with that distracting background tile clipping in Space Harrier, but they raised the bar for arcade-style experiences on a home console in the same way that their superscalar counterparts set a new standard for arcades. With Enduro Racer, Sega didn't even try. This interpretation of the arcade game makes zero effort to present a super scalar style experience. You won't find a behind the character viewpoint here or a convincing sense of 3D immersion. Instead, we've ended up with something more akin to Zaxxon meets Excitebike, an isometric viewpoint that attempts to convert the layout of the super scalar racetracks into a top down diorama view. It's not terrible as such things go, in its way, it's pretty innovative since very few of any racing games had used this perspective to this point. But it lacks the visceral thrill of the coin-op title, which sent players careening down a racetrack on a dirt bike and flying high into the air. Now, I might theorize that the vertical element of Enduro Racer led to Sega's radical home overhaul. If you look at the Master System versions of Hang On and Space Harrier, both games present their freaky fast first-person viewpoints along flat surface planes. The highway in Hang On undulates left and right, but it's all horizon in every direction, like a more scenic view of West Texas. Space Harrier allowed its agile warrior to zip around the screen in all directions, but the ground beneath them always unfurled as a barren expanse, despite their dramatic rock formations in the distance. Enduro Racer simply isn't the same experience without all the constant rises and dips, the undulations along the road sending you flying off the surface and forcing you to contend with unseen hazards over the next crest. And it would be reasonable to think that the Master System simply couldn't pull this off. I say would be because, well, a few months later, OutRun would come along and perfectly recreate the arcade game's gentle slopes and gradients. 
I think a more likely answer is that Sega could have recreated Enduro Racer pretty accurately, but chose not to because the game simply didn't have sufficient clout to warrant the effort. The company put Wunderkind Yuji Naka on Space Harrier, after all. They could have assigned him to Enduro Racer next, but instead they shifted him to programming duties on Fantasy Star. So Sega clearly and correctly recognized that creating a viable Dragon Quest competitor was more important to their home console ambitions than a great port of a second-tier superscalar title. Anyway, once you get past the disappointment of Enduro Racer looking nothing like its arcade counterpart, it plays pretty well. The tracks do a solid job of recreating the general layouts of the coin-op courses with similar arrangements of road obstacles to maneuver around. The isometric courses include a few features not seen in the arcade, like branching paths, but these don't really amount to much. They also don't make up for the fact that the Master System game fails to incorporate the dips and rises in the road that make the arcade racing experience so breathtaking. The irony is that these isometric courses are just as flat as those in Hang-On, and only the ramps that appear along the way send players flying into the air. Otherwise, it's a pretty straightforward racer. In fact, in many cases, you're better off avoiding the ramps altogether. Launching across multiple jumps in succession ends up slowing you down, and Enduro Racer measures victory by the standard Sega Racer metric, a strict time limit. Fail to reach the goal before the timer runs to zero and the game ends instantly. So generally speaking, you're better off avoiding all but the major ramps. The emphasis on ramps and jumps might put one in mind of a perspective-shifted Excitebike. Sadly though, Enduro Racer doesn't give you that level of control over your racer's balance, so the only time leaping a ramp, as opposed to swerving to drive past it, offers a genuine advantage comes when you're trying to clear the swampy courses where shallow water slows you down and deep water wipes you out. And ramps can be helpful when avoiding rocky patches that can cause damaging wipeouts. To its credit, Enduro Racer does attempt to add some systemic depth to the Master System version. Every opponent you pass during a race nets you a bonus point in the post-race score tally, and you can exchange these points for a one-time bike upgrade to various components like handling and endurance. You also have a sort of health meter at the bottom of the screen that tracks the damage you take during a race. Unlike the part upgrades, the damage meter is persistent between races and continues accumulating, though I didn't notice any impact on my performance as the counter ticked up. Then again, maybe that feature only really came into play in the Japanese release. On Mark III, Enduro Racer was twice the game that we received on Master System, quite literally. The Mark III release shipped with 10 tracks versus the US version's 5, and it also included some visual niceties lacking on Master System. Not only did you get a course map charting your progress between races, the tracks themselves relatively burst with life, featuring all sorts of trackside details like onlookers. This isn't a case of the US version shipping first and then getting an upgrade for Japan, as with Irem's Metal Storm on Famicom. The Mark III game arrived several months before the American release, so it really seems like a situation where Sega of America just cheaped out and decided to downgrade the game to ship on a less capacious and therefore less expensive ROM. The tracks we did get are pretty diverse and offer a decent selection of distinct challenges, ranging from standard dirt tracks to rocky desert wastes and swampy marshlands to a wildly irresponsible headlong romp through crumbling ancient ruins. So it's not like the American version feels totally samey or something. It's just that the Mark III release looks vastly more refined, and rather than simply looping into more difficult iterations of the same tracks after five courses, it gives players 10 unique challenges. With its missing content, the Master System cartridge feels both anemic and underbaked. So it's difficult not to see Enduro Racer as anything besides a letdown, given what it started from, the arcade release, and where it should have ended up, the Mark III cartridge, the product that shipped to American fans seems almost not worth the effort. Don't worry though, Redemption is on its way for Master System, and the streets will run with pinstriped blood.